So our next speaker is Judith Crudois. She is the longtime archivist at Christ Church College, I believe, since 1994. And her talk is called All Change, which on the first version of our program, I wrote is All Rise. I don't know. My husband's a big Aaron Judge fan. I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> but Judith, if you want to turn on your microphone and your camera, we are ready to hear from you. Welcome. I'm with you. That's great. Um, Christchurch, as I'm sure you know, was founded three times. Um, a little bit greedy, perhaps. Um, but then Christchurch has always been enormous, unusual and unique. Its first foundation was as Cardinal College. Um, established by Thomas Wolsey in 1525, and it was to be the biggest and best of all the colleges in Oxford. Of course, Wolsey soon fell out of favour. Um, he failed to obtain that divorce between Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon, and his college was dissolved in 1530. And it was replaced by this rather odd, much smaller interim foundation called King Henry VIII College. The tiny membership, of course, must have rattled around in the half-built college, and Henry can't possibly have thought that this was a suitable replacement for Wolsey's grand plan. And indeed, only a few years later, Henry VIII and Thomas Cromwell came up with the idea of Christchurch, a joint college and cathedral, unique in the world to this day. This is what it looked like in the, in the very early years, um, not as you would recognise it today, but the beginnings are there. Together, Wolsey and Henry had created an establishment headed by a dean and canons who formed the governing body of Christ Church, with 100 students who were in receipt of stipends paid from the huge endowment of land and livings granted by Henry, and all the staff were necessary to run the college and cathedral. A few years later, fee-paying undergraduates, as we would recognise them today, began to arrive too. Students, always with an uppercase S, were nominated by the Dean and Canons, and then were formally elected in December. Provided they remained unmarried, took the most basic level of ordination, took their examinations at the prescribed times, and didn't have an in income above £10 per annum, students could remain in post for life and were not expected to do anything to earn their keep. And this is a slide from the first chapter book showing the earliest students, these are the most senior men. And there's a couple more pages which show the men as they get younger and younger, and the youngest first entrant was only 13 years old. Very few were given authorization to actually become tutors. Most men, of course, didn't stay. They had family estates to run, or they became MPs or clergymen. And although they were the sort of equivalent of fellows in other colleges, Christchurch's students actually had no say at all in the administration of college or of the estates, nor did they receive any benefit from the estates except for their own small stipends. All the power and all of the wealth was concentrated in the hands of the dean and the eight canons. This perceived unfairness caused resentment almost from day one, but by the middle of the 19th century, the frustrations boiled over into full-scale rebellion and in part push Christchurch closer to the major reforms which were being introduced over the next two decades. Charles Dodgson, with his friends, particularly Henry Lydon, was active and vocal in the debates which would produce the college that we know today. On the 4th of November 1846, just five years before Charles Dodgson arrived in Oxford as an undergraduate, Christchurch celebrated its tercentenary. Dean Thomas Gaysford was a staunch anti-reformist and must have reveled in the chance to look back at the Christchurch that he wanted to preserve, rather than being forced to face the reforms that were being imposed on the university and the colleges from within, from the national government and from the church. At the special celebratory dinner, High Table was occupied by the Dean and Canons, special guests and the aristocratic undergraduates in their tasseled and gilded gowns. The students, sat halfway down the hall, still relatively unimportant, unimportant in the life of the college. While High Table had turbot, the students had cod. 
it's a picture from Mr. Verdant Green. I, um, Mark was showing you some illustrations from this amazing book that you, you really must read if you haven't, haven't already. It's very funny and has these great illustrations. An undergraduate's life in 1851, when Dodgson arrived, was very much the same as it had been in 1551. Men were given a series of books to read on which they had to discourse, both in hall and to their tutors. They were tested on their reading each term at collections, by the voce examinations conducted by the dean or the censors. Chapel was compulsory and the morning service took place before breakfast. Students known as prickbills were selected to mark the men off as they entered through the cathedral door. Um, this picture was um, before the alterations to the cathedral by Gilbert Scott in the 1870s. It's still the very different window at the east end and the 17th century um, pews and stalls that were installed by Dean Ducker in, in the 1630s. Social and sporting activities had always been carefully controlled and regulated, and most sports had been conducted by individuals rather than as college activities. Wolsey, particularly, had been very strict in his statutes for Cardinal College about what young men could and couldn't do within the college walls. But from the beginning of the 19th century, organised and intercollegiate sports were beginning to take off, particularly rowing, of course. Cricket had become part of the wider social calendar. And varsity mas matches actually attracted fashionable crowds of thousands. Um, one, one summer match had 20,000 people coming to watch it. Up until the early years of the 19th century, the undergraduate degree had consisted largely of classical works. This is not, it's not a terribly good picture, but this shows you the collections records of a, of a couple of students in, in the early part of the 19th century. Um, if you can read it, you'll see that uh, they're reading Homer and Virgil. A uh, little bit of um, who else is in there? And they've, they've got the evangelists, so they're doing some scripture studies uh, and some theology and a little bit of maths thrown in for good measure. Classics and an understanding of the scriptures were considered to be all that a gentleman needed to progress in life. But the spread of empire, new scientific discoveries, new industries and enterprises, and the end of the Napoleonic Wars prompted change. New subjects were slowly introduced, and from 1805, men could take a paper in mathematics rather than it just being part of the old BA. This is a part of the maths courses that the men took, some of them just in their spare time for, for a bit of fun and a bit of extra education. Slowly, New honours subjects were added that could, like maths, be taken as additional papers, including natural science, jurisprudence and modern history. But this put a tremendous strain on the tutors, most, if not all of whom, had been brought up in the classical system. In 1858, Henry Thompson, who was an undergraduate just a few years after Dodgson, reported that there were only seven tutorial staff, six classical, and Dodgson himself, who taught mathematics of which Euclid was a particularly big part. Dodgson himself had around 70 tutees of his own that he had to manage, and it's quite, quite a tall order. And to try to keep one step ahead, of course, of all these new fields of expertise. Many undergraduates, if they could afford it, turned to external tutors to help them through examinations. The government commission set up to initiate educational and financial reforms disapproved of college revenues being used to fund huge fellowships, or in Christchurch's case, of course, studentships, most of whom were completely inactive. The studentships, as we've say, seen, were in the gift of the dean and canons rather than being competitive, and most men, as long as they fulfilled those few basic obligations, could remain in post for life. Only a very few had any function, whether that be tutorial or administrative. It was time in modern Victorian Britain for things to be shaken up. Fortunately, at least for the university co commissioners and perhaps ultimately for Christchurch too, Dean Gaysford, who'd been a thorn in the reformist sides for two decades, died in 1855, and his place was taken by Henry Liddell, 
an energetic man of both administrative and academic prowess. I always think this is such a beautiful picture of him. He looks incredibly handsome. Little had been an active and regular member of the commission which had sought to reform the university. And some of the younger students following in the footsteps of their predecessors who had been campaigning for a greater say in college matters for centuries must have hoped for great things from their new leader. But it turned out that Little, while approving of some of the commissioner's ideas, such as the declericalization of the student body, was not particularly keen on opening up college governments for a wider group. I suppose once you've got power, you want to hang on to it. The Oxford Act of 1854, in which both Henry Liddell and alumnus William Gladstone, another rather attractive looking young man, were heavily involved. And they did little to change things except to make some of the studentships competitive and abolish the religious tests which required new undergraduates to conform to the Anglican Church. Um, at this time, it was only for the undergraduates. It wasn't until 1871 that tutors and senior members of the colleges um, didn't have to be Anglican. At Christchurch, the students began to push for greater change. They'd barely been consulted concerning the reforms that were being proposed by the government and the university. None had been formally asked for their opinion except for Osborne Gordon, and then only in his capacity as a member of the Tutors Association. Their proposals for change were not on the whole radical, but they did aim to enhance the position of the students in the administration of the college, and perhaps the most frightening suggestion as far as the canons were concerned was that college and cathedral should, for the first time, be administered completely separately. The agreement that was reached, in which Dodgson, along with his friends, Lydon, Sanford and Thomas Beerbane, all took a part, was hardly successful. In many ways, the Christchurch Ordinance of 1858 made matters worse, creating, in effect, three governing bodies, an electoral board to manage teaching, a combined body of dean, canons and senior censors who would govern the students, and the dean and chapter who would manage the cathedral and all disciplinary matters. It didn't rest well with anyone and actually probably made matters worse, not least because opening up studentships to competition meant that there were now men potentially running Christchurch who knew little of its peculiarities and some things don't change. Even the admission of the Prince of Wales as an undergraduate did nothing to halt the reforming tide, however. This is a rather ghastly painted photograph um, showing the Prince of Wales in the middle seated um, at the races. The straw that broke the camel's back as far as the Dean and Canons were concerned was the bread and butter row of 1865. 108 commoners of Christchurch presented a petition to the Dean and Chapter, complaining about the extortionate charges made by the butler on basic food items, such as bread and butter. The butler bought these in wholesale, but then put a 60% markup on them before selling on to the students. And he wasn't alone. The cook and the matzipal were doing much the same thing. This is the, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this gorgeous picture of the of the kitchen at Christchurch and apart from the fact we now have electric and gas cookers in there it looks much the same now as it did as it did then. A letter describing the matter was published in the Times newspaper and we all know how much governing bodies hate publicity. Just two weeks after the letter appeared in the press Christchurch had decided to put the butler, the cook and the manciple on salaries and to appoint a professional steward to manage domestic affairs. Although a relatively small act in the reforms that were to follow, it was a significant step for Christchurch towards the Christchurch Oxford Act of 1867, which came about after long and intensive negotiations with the students. At last, things changed. The students became, as fellows in other colleges, part of a new governing body which would administer college and its revenues, and the cathedral became almost a part of college. It would be a while before Dean Liddell and Bishop Wilberforce particularly succeeded in fully opening the cathedral to a wider diocese and still some years before governing body became largely secular. All these upheavals coloured Charles Dodgson's first two decades at Christchurch. He started his residence, as you know, in a small room over the cloisters, probably not unlike this one, before moving eventually as a tutor into the rooms in Tom Quad, for which he is best known, 
and above which he erected his last studio. It's a picture of the, of the, um, the same room that before he occupied it. Um, all around him during his half century of residence, you would have seen Lidl's major building works taking place. In the 1850s, a start was made on the restoration of the cathedral with preliminary work being done to move those 17th century stalls and to improve the heating, during which a strange reliquary chamber was found under the crossing. Uh, this is a, a drawing of the, of the chamber that was found at the, made at the time. The works on the cathedral and around Tom Quad would continue all through the 1870s and 80s. This is what Dodgson would have known when he first arrived at Christchurch, and within 30 years, it had changed to this with the entry to the cathedral and the new Wolsey Tower and the new pinnacles on the, on the top of the, of the hall. Also in the 1850s, Dodgson would have seen the contents of the anatomy school, moved out to the new university museum, and the building converted into a chemistry laboratory. And then in 1862, meadow buildings began to rise, taking the place of some medieval and 17th century residences. This is the first design um, by Thomas Newenham Dean. Um, and this is meadows as it is today, but taken very shortly after it was complete. It still looks very fresh, doesn't it? Mercifully, the building work was far enough away from Tom Quad not to have disturbed him. Perhaps a good thing, as Alice must have been taking shape in his mind and on paper. A noisy construction site might have been disastrous for English children's literature. Thank you. Thank you, Judith.